So you finally get your hands on a brand new Blackmagic Pocket cinema camera. How do you set it up for filmmaking? What settings should you be using to get the most out of this camera? So when powering up the camera you'll be greeted with this screen. On the top left corner you have your frames per second, your FPS. Next up you have your shutter which you can choose to have in both shutter speed or shutter angle. I go for shutter angle but we'll get to that a bit later in the video. And next to shutter you have your iris, but since I don't have a lens attached right now, no information regarding iris is present. And for those of you unfamiliar with the word iris, it's the same as aperture. Next up you have the option between having the record time that will roll as you can see here. Or you can actually just tap it and then you have your time code. You can actually jam sync the timecode of this camera through the 3.5mm microphone input. After timecode we have the ISO followed by white balance and tint. After that you have your battery info display, which you can choose to either display in volts or in percentages. I generally stick to voltages since they are more consistent. And if you're looking at the voltage, then the camera, while using internal batteries, will cut power around 6.3 or 6.2 volts. If you look at the bottom row you have your histogram followed by a record button on the touchscreen and your card information. So if you want to format your cards you actually go in through here. As you can see I currently have 34 minutes remaining on this card. It's a 64 gigabyte card and if I want to format the SD card I'll press format SD card choose my format, I always go with XFAT and then you just press format SD card. And as you can see here, my next real number will be A008. And if I don't want that, I can actually go back here and I'll press format SD card and then I can edit my real number right here. So if I'm starting a new project and I want my next card to be A001, I can just change this to 1 and update. So once I go to format SD card, my next reel will be A001. I'll format the SD card. And as a fail safe, Blackmagic had implemented a function where you actually have to hold down this button for three seconds. And now it's formatting the SD card. And formatting complete. Your card is now ready to use. Okay, and next up we have our audio meters and if you tap the audio meters you can actually change the gain for both channel 1 and 2 as well as change your headphone volume. If you want to change the audio inputs however you have to go through the menu. And speaking of menu, let's dive right into it. So to enter the menu you press the button right here. And as you can see the menu here has different sections, you have record, monitor, audio, setup, presets and LUTs. And in each of these sections you have multiple pages, so in record we have three different pages. So let's look at the first one. This is where we choose our codec and our resolution. So for example, I'm currently using Blackmagic RAW, but the other option is using ProRes. Blackmagic RAW you have two options, you can go constant bitrate, which you have 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1 and 12 to 1. 3 to 1 is the highest quality but also the largest file sizes. And I'll tend to stay away from 3 to 1 unless you really need some green screen or compositing work. But for general work around 8 to 1 seems to be a pretty good sweet spot. But if you go to constant quality you have two options. Q0 and Q5. When using constant quality you don't have a set bitrate. The camera actually analyzes the scene and determines if you need more or less bitrate within a given spec. So for Q0 your bitrate will be closer to 3 to 1, sometimes a bit above, sometimes a bit below. And when using Q5 your bitrate will be close to 8 to 1 or 12 to 1. But for now I'm going to leave it at Q5. But if you want to shoot in ProRes you also have that option. In ProRes you can shoot in ProRes HQ, 42, LT or Proxy. 
but for me personally I only shoot in ProRes if I want to shoot in HD in 1920x1080 because Blackmagic RAW is a very efficient codec. The file sizes when shooting in 4K are pretty similar between ProRes and uh, Blackmagic RAW so then I prefer to keep the flexibility of RAW since it's not costing me anything extra in terms of storage. But if you want to shoot in 1080p, Blackmagic RAW, since it is RAW, will window your sensor. But when shooting in ProRes, you can shoot 1080p while using the full sensor, which then downscales to 1080p. And to demonstrate this, if we go back to Blackmagic RAW here, and currently on 4K DCI, that's when we'll use the full sensor. But if I go to 1080p, you'll see right next to resolution we have sensor windowed. That means that currently we're only using the center 1920 by 1080 pixels of the sensor. So we have a pretty heavy crop going right now. When shooting in Blackmagic RAW you have the option of using either one of these options in terms of resolution. But when shooting in ProRes you can see that we only have the option of shooting in 4K DCI, Ultra HD or HD. And if you want to shoot in higher frame rates, the resolution you choose here will determine how high you can go. If you shoot in 4K DCI, you can go up to 60 FPS. In 4K 2.4 to 1, you can go up to 75 FPS. So by cropping the top and the bottom of the screen and using a widescreen aspect, you can now go from 60 to 75 frames per second instead. Ultra HD is 60 frames per second, same as 4K DCI. In 2.8K anamorphic, you can go up to 80 frames per second. And in 2.6K, which was added as a firmware update, you can go up to 120 frames per second. And same goes for 1080p. But I would stick to 2.6K instead of 1080p if I want to shoot higher frame rates, since you get a high resolution as well as using a bigger portion of the sensor, since you're shooting a one-to-one -one pixel from the sensor. Speaking of high frame rates, let's go to the next page where you can actually put them in. But let's start from the top. On the top of the page you have dynamic range. You can choose either video, extended video or film. And here I would never choose anything else than film. By choosing something else other than film, you'll just limit the dynamic range of the camera. Which in my opinion is just a bit stupid to be honest. Next up you have sensor area, and for our current resolution that option is grayed out. But if we go back to the last screen, choose ProRes and then 1080p. Now we have the option of actually choosing the full sensor which will then downscale to 1080p, or we can use a smaller portion of the sensor, the 2.6k or the 1 to 1 pixel HD. And the sensor area is actually what determines how high you can go on your off-speed frame rate. But let's go back to Blackmagic RAW for now and choose 2.6K. As you can see here, our sensor area is set to 2.6K. It's grayed out since we're shooting in RAW. We can't determine how much of the sensor we're using for this one. And my project frame rate is set to 25 frames per second. And if I enable off-speed recording, any frame rate I choose here, currently on 60, will then be slowed back down to 25 frames per second. And in 2.6K we can go as high as... You guessed it... 120 frames per second. And there we go. So currently we'll be shooting 120 frames every second, which will then be slowed down back to 25 frames per second, giving us pretty slow footage. Next up you have your preferred card for recording. What this does is simply, if you have both a CFS card and an SD card in the camera, which one do you want to have the priority of being recorded to first? And next up we have stop recording if card drops frame. So if your card is too slow and can't write fast enough for the recording option you're using, the camera will stop recording if you drop frames. And on the next page we have our time-lapse options and detail sharpening as well as apply a lot in file. So time-lapse that's pretty self-explanatory. Detail sharpening is just adding in-camera sharpening and if you use that you have the option of using default, medium or high but I keep it off. 
I don't like to apply in-camera sharpening. If I want to add sharpening, I can do it myself in post. And next up we have apply LUTs in file, which will simply pass along the LUT that you're currently using as metadata with the file. But this option is more interesting if you're shooting in ProRes, because let's go back to ProRes and let's see what the camera says now. Now it just says record LUT to clip. And this can be very useful if you're handing off footage to someone else and it's not intended to be graded. You want to shoot using the Blackmagic film to get all that dynamic range. And then maybe using a specific LUT, maybe the battery LUT or a Pocket 4K to Alexa LUT. If you enable record LUTs to clip, you'll actually burn the LUT into the clip. So if you're handing off footage that is not intended to be graded, this could be a great option. And that wraps up record. So let's go to the next section, monitor. In the monitor section you have LCD, HDMI or both. So you can choose to have some stuff enabled on the LCD screen on the back of the camera or some other stuff enabled on the HDMI. You can set these up separately and they don't have to be the same as each other. So if I go through LCD I can for example turn on my grid and my zebras here and in HDMI I can still have them turned off. But let's turn them off for now and just look at some of the options we have here. We can choose to have a clean feed. We can choose to display 3D LUTs, but you can also import your own custom LUTs into the camera. You have your Zebras, your Focus Assist, Frame Guides, Grids, Safe Area Guide, which I basically never use, False Color, which I do use a lot by the way, and next up we have our status text, which is basically the information on the screen. Your aperture, your ISO and so on. And you can choose if you want your audio meters displayed on screen, or if you want to see the codec and resolution instead. So if I go to codec and resolution, and then exit, now we see we have our codec, Blackmagic RAW and a resolution 4K DCI. But if you quickly want to toggle, let's say, focus peaking on or off. You don't actually have to go back into the menu to do that. If you tap the icon in the top left corner, you actually have some of the options right here. So first up we have our zebras. You can turn them on and off or set the level of the zebras. Next up we have our focus peaking, low, medium, high and on and off. Your safe area guide. I currently have it set to two to one, but it's off. So if I turn it on, this is what it looks like and then you have some different options of aspect ratios to choose from here. And next up we have our grids, the rule of thirds, the horizon, the crosshair and the dot. If I choose the crosshair then I can't have horizon on at the same time since they're basically very very similar. The horizon is a crosshair but it also shows you if the camera is level or not. And if I turn it on this is what it looks like. And as you can see, Horizon basically looks like a crosshair, but if I tilt the camera, you can see we're off axis. Well, let's turn that off for now, and let's go to the next one, our safe area guide, and after that, false color, which I use a lot. So much, in fact, that I actually have it programmed to a specific function button on the camera, but we'll get to that a bit later. So let's head back into the menu and look at HDMI instead. As you can see, the first page is identical to the LCD, but on the next page we have one thing that differs. We can choose to display status text for either a cinematographer or a director. When using the cinematographer option you get more of the technical information about the camera, and when using the director option you get stuff like the roll, the take, the scene, if you have that set up through the camera. But that's it for monitor, so let's go to the next section which is audio. When entering the audio section you see that the camera records two different channels of audio and we can control these independently of each other. So I can set channel 1 to be like let's say a XLR mic input and channel 2 to be through the 3.5mm mic input. And you can actually choose if it's through the right or left channel of that input or if you want to use the mono setting. The camera also has the option of using built-in microphones 
It has two microphones, a left and a right one, so you can use camera left, camera right, or camera mono. The gain can also be controlled independently of each other. And on the next page we have headphone volume, speaker volume, and XLR phantom power. Since we set up channel 1 to use a XLR mic input, we can now choose if we want to send phantom power, which is 48 volts, to that microphone through the mini XLR port on the camera. And lastly we have some options for the audio meters of the camera. But I'm no audio expert by any stretch of the imagination, so I'll just leave it at the default option. And that wraps it up for audio, so let's go to the next section, setup. In the setup section you can set up stuff like your date and time and the language, but after that we get some more interesting options. We can choose to use either shutter angle or shutter speed. If you come from more typical stills cameras such as DSLRs or mirrorless cameras, you're probably more familiar with shutter speed. But when it comes to cinema cameras or video cameras, you're generally using a shutter angle instead. If you're familiar with the rule of using a shutter speed that is double your frame rate, that actually comes from shutter angle. That rule is called the 180 degree shutter rule and actually comes from using a shutter angle of, you guessed it, 180 degrees. So if you set up your camera using shutter angle, you can leave it at 180 degrees regardless of the frame rate you're using. So I always keep my camera at shutter angle. And next up we have flicker free shutter, which is basically if you live in the EU or a PAL based region you'll leave it at 50 Hz. If you're in the US or an NTSC region, leave it at 60 Hz. And under that we have image stabilization, which will be an option if you're using an image stabilized lens, which I'm not, that's why that option is grayed out. And time code drop frame. And on the next page we have the option of setting up function buttons. You have three different function buttons on the camera and they're all on the top of the camera, F1, F2 and F3. And you have the option of setting up the button as a preset or a toggle. I have all three of mine set up as toggles, but that's totally up to you and what functions you use the most. So for F1 I have set up to toggle and then false color. I have this function enabled on both the LCD screen on the camera and the HDMI output. So when I press F1, I'll toggle false color on, and I'll press it again, I'll toggle it off, and so on. Next up I have F2, which I have set to display a lot. And this one is also displayed on both the LCD and the HDMI output. And my F3 is also set to toggle, both on the LCD and the HDMI, and this one is set to focus assist. But you do have more options than those. You can set up your function buttons to toggle features like focus assist, frame guides, display lots, clean feed if you want to send out, for example, a clean feed to HDMI when recording but you want your other info displayed while setting up the shot, you can just do this. So when I press F3, I'll toggle the clean feed on and when I press it again, I'll toggle it off. That is just one example of how you can set up your function buttons. But I want to leave mine at focus assist for F3 for now. But you can also set it up as presets. So if I go to presets, maybe I want F3 to be white balance 2500. So I'll set up F3, preset and then white balance. And now it's set to 2500. So if I press the button F3 on the camera, I will set my white balance to 2500. Or maybe you want to set your camera to a different frame rate. So if you instead go to FPS and set up the frame rate to, let's say, I don't know, let's say 42 for some reason. If I now press F3 on the camera, I'll set my frame rate to 42 frames per second as an off-speed recording, by the way. But that's not how I want my F3 button to be set up, so I'll go back to toggle and then we have focus assist. 
let's go to the next page. And here we have the option of having our tally light turned on or off when recording. The tally light is a red LED on the camera that turns on when recording and off when you're not recording. And you can also choose the brightness of this LED, low, medium or high. Tele light is a useful feature to be able to tell when the camera is rolling or not, but if you're shooting into some kind of reflection, the tele light might show up in your footage, and that's why it's important to know that you can turn it off. Next up you have your hardware ID, your current software or firmware version, as well as the option of having playback to playback all clips or just a single clip. And on the next page we have Bluetooth. And here you can actually connect your phone to the camera and there's different apps that will allow you to have pretty much full control of the camera remotely. You can set up your codec, your resolutions, change your ISO and so on just through Bluetooth. And there's also some more basic apps which will just simply give you the option of start-stop recording remotely. And next up we have the last page of the setup which you can perform a camera setting reset back to factory settings. You can have pixel remapping which is basically black shading or calibrate motion sensor which if you remember the horizon option earlier in the grids this is where you can calibrate the sensor by putting it on a flat surface and telling the camera this is a level. But if you go to pixel remapping and press remap pixels you can see when the last time you did a pixel ray mapping was and the camera will also tell you to attach a lens cap before proceeding. This performs a pixel remap of your camera sensor. This action will take about a minute and then remap. So now we're remapping the pixels on the sensor. And once it's done it says remapping complete your camera is ready to use. Okay thank you. That's it for the setup section of the menu, so let's go to presets. And here you can actually save different presets of the way you've set up the camera. So if you're happy with all the settings we've currently set up on the camera, you can actually save this as a preset. You can name this to no, for example, and now you have a preset that says no. So if you tap it and then tap the check mark down here, you will enable that preset. As you can see, I have two different presets already set up. I have 120 frames per second at 2.6K, B-RAW 8 to 1, or 4K D to 1 Q5, which I've set up at 25 frames per second. And by setting it up as presets, I don't have to change the codec, the resolution, and then the frame rate. I can just do it all at once. And if you want to delete the preset, you just press the trash icon in the bottom right corner and delete. And our last option in the menu is LUTs. And this is where you can choose to display different LUTs on the camera. You can import your own, but there are some options already installed on the camera out of the box. You have the Pocket 4K Film to Extended Video as well as Pocket 4K Film to Rec 2020 HLG, Pocket 4K Film to Rec 2020 PQ, or Pocket 4K Film to Video. But if you want to import your own LUTs, simply put them on a CFast or SD card, put that into the camera and tap this icon here. Now you get the option of importing LUTs. So let's press import. And here you can see CFast card or SD card. Let's say we had them on an SD card, then they would show up right here. You will tap the one you want to import and then press import. And that's it. And that's the whole menu of the camera. But we're not done quite yet. If you exit the menu and then swipe left, here you can enter some metadata that will be transferred along with your files. You have metadata on the clip level as well as the project level. And on the clip section, you have basically your digital slate. So you can put in your lens data. The reel will be automatically updated once you put a new card into the camera and format it. You can enter a scene number, let's say scene 5, and this is the first take of scene 5. And for take you have the option of actually having it to be automated. You can turn it on or off. But if you have it on, every time you roll the camera the take will keep going up. 
you can set it to interior or exterior, day or night, as well as marking the last take as a good take. And if we go to project, you can set up some metadata for the project, such as the project name, the director, the camera number for this one, which is camera A. If you have multiple cameras, you can have camera A, B, C, and so on, as well as the camera operator or the DP. So let's go out of the menu back to the main screen. And I'm not a fan of having the codec and resolution here instead of the audio meters, so I'm gonna go back into the menu. Monitor, that's the LCD, and then meters. And there we go, back to normal. Now we instead have a histogram and audio meters. But you don't have to go into the menu to change everything. This camera actually has some buttons here on the back of the camera, as well as some on the top of the camera, but we'll get to those soon. So here you can choose to enter playback mode, go into the menu, magnify the image for zoom, If you use the HFR button, you can toggle high frame rates. So if you look on the FPS right here, currently it says 60 over 25. So I'm now shooting at 60 frames per second, which will then be conformed back to 25. If I press the button once again, we're back to shooting at normal 25 frames per second. And next up we have autofocus and auto iris. Those are not continuous by any means, it's just a simple push autofocus or push auto iris. But let's look at the top of the camera. On the top of the camera we have our power on and off switch. Function button 1, 2 and 3. So if I press function button 1, I'll toggle the false color on. And if I press it again, I'll toggle the false color off. And we also have buttons for ISO, shutter and white balance as well as the record button and a implemented stills button. By pressing this one, you'll get a still image, a raw DNG file on your SD card or CFS card for that matter. And on the front of the camera, you can see we have another record button right here, as well as a dial. This dial can be used to change the aperture if you're using an electronic lens, or if you use it in combination with the ISO shutter or white balance button, you can change either of those settings as well. Tap the ISO button and then you're in ISO mode. Scroll the dial and you change your ISO. Pretty simple, right? But that pretty much wraps it up when it comes to setting up and using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K for filmmaking. There's obviously much more to explore about this camera, but that's it when it comes to the menu system. So like the video if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see some more and I'll see you next time.